Good evening, everyone, and um, welcome uh, to uh, the first of this series uh, with Reconnect and Reframe, particularly tonight, uh, focusing on leadership and the future of leadership in both the dioceses of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island and Fredericton. Uh, for many of us, we've endured some weather of various sorts tonight, uh, so it's a great chance to be inside, hopefully warm and safe. And uh, invite everyone as you're getting comfortable and settled to um, in the chat, just let us know um, that you're here. Um, say hello to uh, both uh, Bishop Sandra and Archbishop David and let us know where you're from as uh, we gather from across our diocese uh, to uh, join in uh, with this uh, conversation tonight. Uh, you'll notice on the bottom of your screen, there should be a button that says chat and you can let us know where you're from. Uh, just make sure you hit everyone uh, on, as you're doing that. Um, and throughout tonight, um, if there are questions that you have, uh, invite you to hit the Q&A button. That's at the bottom of your screen as well. And uh, there will be an opportunity uh, both throughout the conversation uh, to pose some questions to the bishops and uh, certainly at the end as well. So it's uh, great uh, to be with you and uh, to spend uh, some time with you. Um, and it appears the chat is disabled. Thank you for the hordes of people who are letting us know. Uh, we'll get that sorted out, uh, but we're thrilled that you're here irregardless. Um, and obviously the Q&A is working, so thank you. Uh, Lisa, uh, it's great uh, to spend the evening with you. Um, do you wanna explain a little bit more of uh, why we're gathered here tonight? Thanks, Sean. Um, well, um, to start, we are very similar, our diocese of Fredericton and Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, and certainly related to context, similar kinds of parishes. We have lots of geography, lots of travel time, and we have uh, urban centers, obviously, too. Our culture is quite similar. So as Sean and I were talking over the last couple of months about um, what we might do together, um, this seemed to come forward as something would be a real possibility for us to host these series. So this is the first module of four. Um, and one of the reasons, again, is that sharing makes sense and we're stronger together. Um, tonight is the beginning, I said, of, of, of four more. The next three Thursdays are going to be a little different. Tonight we begin um, with our bishops and just getting a sense of kind of the reality. What are some of the, the things that we're seeing already um, and uh, where we've come from and where we think the spirit might be leading us as we're leaning into these, this really new exciting time of doing ministry. So I'm going to first turn things over to Bishop Sandra and have her unpack a little bit about where the Diocese of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island is. Great. Thank you, Lisa. Um, well, first of all, I'm just going to say that I was really formed in, in a team ministry model, um, a clerical ministry model in a sense, but also one that was very empowering uh, with lay people in our parish. So there were a lot of collaborative clergy lay teams for ministries. It, that was a city parish in St. John's, Newfoundland. Um, but it really formed and shaped me. And that was in my role as, as a parishioner and, and leading into ordination. So I've always um, felt really privileged to have learned from people who were very collaborative and who trusted me with ministries as a layperson and as a newly ordained um, deacon at the time and a newly ordained priest who, who helped me to see that I had gifts, um, to be able to discover what those gifts were, to help me build and develop those gifts and actually put them to use um, for the kingdom. And that was wonderful. So uh, when I began in my ministry too, I, I remember when I was at my discernment weekend, the ACPO, that is, as it's known, I remember saying that, I, that this was a really exciting time to be in ministry in the church. And I think they probably wondered then if I was really um, stable. 
and, and asked me to unpack that, but I, but I did see it as a really exciting time. And I will say that that was more than 20 years ago and it's 25 years ago about, and I would say that I've never stopped feeling that this is an exciting time in the life of the church. There are certainly, there certainly have been challenging times and really difficult times, but even in those challenging and difficult times, there's been learning and growth um, and, you know, kind of leaning into God to say, okay, what, what is the spirit doing here? And how is this preparing me or how is this going to help me to in the next phase of my ministry or the next stage of life? So what I've seen um, as, a, as a lay person and then as a parish priest and now as a bishop is um, that that there is real potential and possibility in every time in the life of the church. I know that we often enter these kinds of conversations and in, in our diocese, sometimes these conversations about collaborative ministry happen out of a sense of despair, a desperation, a decline. But I really see potential in having these conversations with a more hopeful um, mind, mindset, uh, thinking about what do we gain by working together and how do we bring gifts together in a way that enables every person to do something that they're gifted in that contributes towards something bigger because you learn very quickly in parish ministry that you do not have all of the gifts that are needed to to lead a parish and if you don't have um, potentially other other clergy around you um, good colleagues if you don't have uh, lay leaders who are really gifted in some areas and not just finance and administration and property, even though those are important, but but spiritual ministries in, in different kinds of ways. They're all spiritual ministries because they're all um, given by the spirit to help in, in the work of the church and the work that God is doing in our midst. But I think just to be aware that we should we could approach this from, from the abundance of the gifts that are around us, the possibilities that are around us, the new ways we have of re-engaging with our communities and our neighborhoods to see what's going on, what is God doing, how do we work with God um, to join in with that work and that ministry that God is calling us to. So, I mean, for me, just being attentive to that and, and watching people who suddenly discover that something is happening in their life that feels like a call and they don't quite know what to do with it because many of the people that I engage with now aren't sure that their call is to parish ministry. They're not sure their call is to ordained ministry at all, but they just feel called to some form of intentional ministry. Um, maybe they've been active in their churches, maybe they haven't, um, but something is stirring in them. So for me, uh, I think this is a really hopeful time and, and still a really exciting time to be engaged in ministry in the church. Thanks, Bishop Sandra. Bishop David. Uh, yes, uh, good evening, everyone. I think um, a lot of what uh, uh, Bishop Sandra has been saying is uh, similar to what we're experiencing here in New Brunswick. And again, we can um, either see this as a time of uh, desperation or we can see this as a time of God's uh, um, revealing a, a greater abundance for us. And I think that latter place is 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 where we've got to be, not because we're just forced to be there, but because um, the God who I've worshipped for uh, far too many years that I care to remember is, is a God of abundance. Mm -hmm. And we see that throughout scripture. So we would, uh, it'd be a work, kind of difficult to see how uh, God's character has changed. But I think we also have to recognize that we're in a very, different place than we were perhaps 50 years ago and that ministry is going to be reshaped and it'll either be reshaped by us in cooperation or it'll be reshaped uh in uh, and kind of forced upon us uh, but i think it's an exciting uh, an exciting time for us i uh, as with bishop sandra come out of a a background where I was originally very much an active layperson in the in the church, and then in the Church of England, I was um, an active lay minister for uh, several years before I was ordained. And so my commitment to lay ministry is uh, basic because it's basic to me. And so, uh, consequently, I think that's where we've got to we've got to look as to where where is God calling people and what is God calling people uh, to do. So I think part of our important role as uh, bishops is to develop um, opportunities for people to explore vocation. 
And by vocation, I don't mean in order to get one of these necessarily. I mean, where is it in our life at work and ministry that God is calling us to, uh, to be and what is he calling us to do? Uh, I'm going to finish with an illustration. I remember when I was a, a layperson back in um, my parish and the rector came in one day and he said, you know, you have a better opportunity of, uh, uh, of doing any kind of evangelism than I have. And I said, why is that? He said, when I go to get my hair cut, the barber always shouts, hello, vicar, at which point everybody suddenly stops and is on their best behavior uh, mm -hmm. and is nervous of the fact that I'm in the in the place. And I think we have to reorient ourselves in order to see that all aspects of ministry are, are equally valid and all aspects of ministry are part of the abundance which God has given to us, whether or not that's licensed ministry in any form or just the vocation that we have as a Christian uh, working out our faith in our daily lives. If I could share, uh, when I was ordained priest, um, Bishop David Torville preached at my ordination. I'm trying to remember if he was a bishop at that point or, or at the cathedral at St. Martin's in Gander. But I remember one of his lines was that priesthood is a lateral move. <laughs> and uh, I, I remember that quite clearly. And I'm not sure at the time it was what I really wanted to hear. Um, but, but it was so true and it was so important because it wasn't about me this was about the whole church and this was one particular ministry that the church was lifting up but it was no more important than other ministries it was simply a particular kind of ministry and i i really appreciate and i've read his sermon many times on my anniversary date but i i really appreciate that reminder and the humility it takes to to remind ourselves that you know none of us is more important than the other we all work collaboratively and bring our gifts I and mean, all of them can be used um, but we we have different distinctive ministries but they're not of greater or less value. God needs them all, and the church needs them all. Um, both of you have highlighted, you know, I think brilliantly and succinctly the realities that we're facing in our, you know, two dioceses. Um, what do you, I mean, you know, what do you say to those of us who have those moments when we hear these new talks of, well, the spirit's doing something new, you know, um, we're adapting, you know, um, that, it, you know, these talks of changing leadership styles is really just, a, you know, a survival mode instead of, you know, it might legitimately be that we're in a new season life of the church where, you know, God is raising up different types of people and kinds of people with different gifts. Um, how, how do we reassure those we're not just trying to batten down the hatches and weather the storm but we're actually being um, sensitive to the leading of the spirit well i think one way we do that is simply by engaging in in places where there is some energy and enthusiasm for this work and and i think then um what happens as a result of some of that kind of helps us to see uh, to see some small things happening it doesn't it doesn't have to be large it, they don't have to be big deep changes um i was listening to a podcast so i was listening to ideas on cbc a few weeks ago and there was an episode on failure and mm -hmm. uh, and, and i shared um with some other folks that this concept of failing small, um, not being afraid to take small risks and just to see what we learn from the from those because every failure, um, when we think about the kinds of technology we have available now, the fact that we can fly somewhere in an airplane or drive a car, uh, that's because someone tried something that failed many times or many, many mm -hmm. kinds of things that failed and they learned from that and they got better at figuring out what the problems were, what the barriers were, what the obstacles were. So I think part of it is, is kind of diving in and trying it. I think there is a need to reassure people that we're not trying to throw everything away. We're not saying traditional parish ministry, traditional liturgies, um, you know, other, other things we have known and have nurtured us throughout our lives all have to go. I think it really is a bit of a both and. It's not a total replacement of something, but in some places, this is going to be a more effective way to deliver ministry. Um, and I think, you know, I guess by the fruits, you will know them. I think it will, where it comes to pass and where we see something energizing um, or new happening. Happening. And that isn't, isn't just about 
more more people worshiping or you know more money it, it's about flourishing ministry and that that can take all kinds of forms it isn't all about numbers but i think where we start to see signs of hope uh, and promise i mean that will that will kind of help us uh, that that's my sense of it anyway hmm. yeah i would agree i don't, the, there's no way we can throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, we need um to use a phrase that I came across recently, pluriform ministry. In other words, it, it's got to look like a lot of different things. Uh, Rowan Williams used the phrase mixed economy. Mm. And I, I think that's 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 a, a, a good phrase and has stood the test of the last 15 years since he said it uh, and the way in which uh, ministry has developed. And I think uh, absolutely Bishop Sandra is right in that I think for those of us who are of the baby boomer and previous generation, uh, which it actually is a lot of people in the church, uh, we've tended to, uh, to want to see things in terms of overarching plans, which actually carry us. We know where we're going to start, we know where we're going to finish, and we're going to just go there. And I think the, the reality is that, um, as Bishop Sandra suggests, we may have to just discern the next little step Mm. And it may look pretty, pretty poor to us. But then again, the five loaves and two fish look pretty poor to the disciples. But <laughs> Jesus managed to do something with those that uh, uh, w was remarkable. And so I think it's how do we have the humility to step away from looking at those big overarching five year plans or whatever. And as individuals and congregations actually try to discern where the next steps are uh, I think and I think one of the uh, just an, another piece on this and I, I know it, folks from my diocese have heard me say this ad nauseum so I apologize but uh, the reality is we don't we can't discern on our own mm. one of our uh, one of our failings uh, as the church over the past couple of hundred years at least is to to emphasize individualism over and above uh, the the community and the and the collective responsibility and um, scripturally we don't actually see this over emphasis on the individual we see the emphasis on the community uh the ecclesia the the coming together the assembly in in the old testament as, uh, and we can see examples in both old and new testament of where the people come together in order to discern the next thing for them and I think we need to, to take that very seriously. There's a need for a plurality of leadership but, and, and, and ministries, but there's also a need for a plurality of discernment amongst us. And that means taking corporate prayer uh, seriously and uh, coming together intentionally to look at our communities where opportunities lie and begin to, to do that together. I think also we need to start really living into some questions and not being so concerned with the answers. And one of the things I've been doing as part of my training to be bishop with the College for Bishops, we were exposed to this question burst format where we try to look at a challenge or a problem and, and just ask questions about it. And the, and the one of the guidelines is you, you can't try to answer the question. So you just go around and someone takes note of the questions and you each ask questions and nobody tries to solve the problem. But what you learn is just in in addressing some of those questions, all of a sudden there's just new insights that emerge. And I think we spend so much time in ministry trying to answer the question. And we don't even know if we're answering the right question or if we've got the right question, or maybe we've we've focused too quickly on solution before we've discerned what is actually happening here and and why is this happening and how might we come at this from a number of different perspectives what do other people think about this and often as clergy I think we're, we're expected and sometimes we expect ourselves to come in with the answers I remember meeting with a group and and they were talking about their ministry and saying you know what what is your hope for our ministry and, and I said look you've done far more than I would ever have hoped for in this ministry I you shouldn't be asking me what I hope for I, I need to learn from you what's possible when you lean into a ministry and you just start to live into it and and start to do some things and connect with new people and reach out to new communities so I you know my hope is that you will just continue doing that I don't have a, an agenda for you or a, a path to follow or a direction um, or a place you need to get to I just need I need you to do what you're keep doing what you're doing 
Well, I think if we just stop looking for solutions so much and focus on being attentive to what's happening around us, seeing what's going on in our neighborhoods and in our communities and in our people and help them explore questions um, and engage in good conversation. I think that that really is uh, really critical at this time. I, I wonder if part of our growing is recognizing that there won't be one model as, as both you uh, Bishop Sandra and Bishop David have said there's not going to be the kind of the one size or the the cookie cutter that will go into every parish or every community that it will be very organic um, and and perhaps in this collaborative ministry leadership team model whatever shape that is perhaps some of the fruit will be that we won't see as much burnout of clergy and lay um, and maybe more joy uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I can't help but think that that would be some of the fruit of the spirit of, of, of a collaborative leadership team um, that that folks really are, are experiencing and uh, are getting great satisfaction from discovering how God could use them in their gifting or their passions and their interests. Wondering what your thoughts are about kind of moving from a model of kind of priest at the center folks with kind of traditional roles but something now quite different i mean we we both are not are both our diocese have been living into some of that and you know with retired clergy and deacons but what do you imagine um this might begin to to morph into as we kind of move from the one kind of model We're both looking at each other. I know. I'm wondering who's going to speak first. <laughs> That's right. I think um, just I just want to go back a little bit before that question and just say one other thing, and uh, which is that the model that many of us have grown up in is what I call a 12 gauge model. In other words, we've had enough people <laughs> to do a multiplicity of things. And we've done a multiplicity of things, but now we don't have those resources, but we're still trying to do the things that we've always done. Right. We need to, to use a different image, which is a rifle and say, okay, what are the things that we can do well? What are the things that need to be done? And, and narrow it down to something where we're not just trying to hit all kinds of things, we're actually, okay, this is, this is the direction in which we believe that, that God is taking us. And I think that's, that's an important thing. And, and be willing to stop those things which are distracting us from that, whatever that, that main thing is. Because what the, the church historically, and it doesn't matter whether it's Anglican or whoever the church historically has been very good at starting things and terrible at ending them <laughs> mm. and we tend to think that we've got to keep these things going but I, I i really don't believe that we have and then we i recently read a book called how to execute which is has nothing to do with the death penalty but everything to do with uh how do you come to a conclusion about something and then do it and basically what that book said was no organization, and, and it, was, it was a totally secular book, no organization can actually deliver on more than two things at any one time. Mm. And it said so many organizations have 12 things they're trying to execute to get, to get into action, and they never get any of them in because they're, they're too spread out. So where is it that the next step is for us and let's take that step, putting our emphasis in that area. Hmm. So I would add to that, I think two things are really critical. And I think that is that you know who you are and you know where you are. <laughs> um, I've been in parishes in very different parts of this province 
with very different resources, with very different people who are the regular worshiping community, uh, very different community realities. So like knowing who you are, really taking time to think about what is the character of this parish? Like what, you know, what, what do we have in abundance or who, who are our people and what is the history of this place? What have we been known for and good at? Hopefully it's, hopefully it's good things, but you know, and, and where do we find ourselves? Um, so looking at places where I've been on the South Shore, where there was a, a real ministry among people who may not have been regular churchgoers, but boy, when lobster season was about to begin or fishing season, they they looked for clergy to to offer a blessing of the fleet. And I remember, you know, <laughs> going out in, in uh, West Green Harbor, having a service in the, in the hall that was packed with people who I never saw in their church building, and then going out um, in, in a small um dinghy to to bless boats and and the ships and the and the crew and the captains and and that was a really important ministry mm. not so important when i moved to wolfville you know not yeah. something that i could have translated there but like what is the reality there it's a university town and and what are the kinds of things that the university teaches so you know we were able to tap into the fact that there's a music program and a music therapy program and maybe some of these musical people might be interested in music things but it's knowing where you are knowing you know what are the passions and interests of your people what are the gifts um we learned in Wolfville I think that that we were teaching community we had a lot of teachers and the former teachers and principals and former principals we had people who were good at helping people to grow and learn and what would it look like if we really tried to help the parish own that as an identity and like like um archbishop david says to really kind of focus on a few things like we could focus on a ministry that was about welcoming students training for ministry or students who were doing a music program and developing a choral scholar program again you know they don't it, not every kind of ministry or program works every in every context but if you know your context well and if you don't know your context well get to know it ask questions walk around look around notice things about where you live and who the people are that live there and where they go where they have coffee where do they get their hair cut you know what kinds of services do they avail of where do you encounter people and where do you encounter people that don't go to church like so what, what can you learn about some of that um, that then you can translate back into, you know, how might this be something that we could participate in as a, as an out, as a ministry of some sort, or is this an appropriate ministry? So again, identity and context, I think, are critical. If we know uh -huh. those things, if we know who we are and who we aren't, we'll stop trying to be like the parish next door who has this wonderful program that we can't emulate because we're not them and we don't need to be them. Mm. We be who we are, who God has called us to be in this place, in this time, and in this context. And I think allied to that, uh, Bishop Sandra, we've also got a, and I said this at our recent Diocesan Synod, I think there are two, there are often two views of church that people have. One is what I might want to call the, the news church. In other words, the, the type of church that appears on the CBC, the CTV, the Globe and Mail, which is usually often, most often, not a pretty picture. And we have to recognize that reality. We have to recognize that the church does not have a good reputation. Because when people hear the word church, they don't necessarily think of individual denominations, they just think of church. And, and we need to recognize that and acknowledge that. But I think the other piece about the local is that the vast majority of people, and it, it doesn't always hold good, but the vast majority of people who encounter the church in the local context actually have a good experience. And it doesn't necessarily relate to what they're hearing from right. media. And so the local is really important in this, to be able to, if you like, restate the um the essentials of the uh, of the gospel beauty peace justice walking humbly with our god and all those kind of things and and we can restate those much more easily and much more relationally at the local level uh as we discern as you say where where it is our strengths are and what the opportunities are within our community and that then we're never going to kind of resolve the 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 media image of ourselves, other than through local contact, I don't think. 
both of you have have kind of been hitting on this and uh Sandra I, lo I love the illustration you used about the fishing season and and being invited out to celebrate that and um one of the things I've I've encountered um particularly in our diocese but I mean certainly this is true across the church we've been used to an understanding that being part of the church uh regardless of denomination meant you're there every Sunday um you know, somewhere we have ingrained in our head that um, buried deep, probably in the Apocrypha, um, is church happens at 1030 on a Sunday morning. Um, and and it's every Sunday and nothing else uh, is the same. But I think one of the realities that we're realizing is more and more as the world around us has shifted, um, and that's good. I'm not looking for us to uh, petition for things to go back. <laughs> But um, Sunday morning doesn't necessarily fit for some family dynamics, some people with jobs, all those sorts of things. Um, and some people are, you know, thrilled to worship at the Church of the Holy Comforter um, on a Sunday morning. Um, what, do we, uh, what words or encouragement can you offer to those who are kind of on that cusp of saying, is it okay for us to look at Tuesday night in the park or, you know, Saturday night at the community hall or, you know, and as you rightly pointed out, you know, on the side of the wharf, um, you know, at fishing season. Yeah, well, and a couple of things about that, because I think the mistake we would make is by saying, gee, isn't it wonderful to see all those people? It's too bad they don't come to church. Exactly. Instead of saying what we've been doing in this moment has been church. And I had that experience in Shelburne. We had a lovely kind of gathering with food and, um, and, and invited all kinds of people in. And there were families with children. There were older folks. We had deep conversations. It was in Advent. And we talked about gifts and gifts we've given and gifts we've received. And wow, there were deep conversations that night. And the kids had some activities and the adults talked. And then um, we had a great turnout. And the next day or in the days to follow, someone said, oh, wow, it was great that there were all those people there. Hopefully, you know, if only they came to church or hopefully they'll come to church. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, what we were doing in that space was church. Um, I had conversations with people that I never have on a Sunday morning. There's no place for that in the liturgy. Uh, so I, I would validate that. I'd also say that there have been times in my life that I have drifted away from the church. Once I was confirmed and it felt like I didn't know where my place was anymore after Sunday school and confirmation. And I think a very interactive way of learning and engaging with scripture and, um, and uh, theology, understandings about who God is. Um, church at that time for me was a bit boring. Um, I tried to sing in the choir, I couldn't sing high enough and that didn't seem to work. And there really just wasn't a place. And, and it was as a young adult, I still went, you know, mostly Christmas Eve, maybe Easter, but occasionally family celebrations, but didn't have a regular involvement. But then um, there was an opportunity to, to attend uh, an evening service. And as a young adult, someone invited me, it's my husband now, <laughs> who invited me to go to this evening service um, at St. Paul's Halifax. And it was a very informal uh, gathering. It wasn't typical evening prayer, even song. We met in the chancel. There was a guitar. It was a short service with, you know, just a brief reflection. And then we went and had tea and coffee um in you know another room and this was an opportunity to just talk ask questions it was very informal and I thought wow this is this is I could do this um and that's kind of where where I was at that stage of my life where I was I had lots of questions and I didn't ask any of them right away I just listened but I learned it was a safe place to ask questions and that was you know an open door for me and then when I later um, moved around a bit and more it was about finding a place where I felt I could belong and, and it felt like home. Um, again, I found an evening service with a very interactive format and some some kind of extemporary prayer and there was a prayer and praise band and and you know because I grew up in the Anglican Church I am a cradle Anglican it, it, it in time I did gravitate back to Sunday morning I I missed the Eucharist and that wasn't a common feature of those other other gatherings um, those other forms of of worship and church uh, but but they were valid in their own right and and they met a need and they enabled people who wouldn't normally show up on a Sunday morning to show up. 
in my experience, they, they were ways back. And I think if all we're offering people is Sunday morning um, or what looks like traditional worship and traditional, I don't mean by which book you use and which hymns you sing, but something that looks like that shape and structure. I think there are a lot of people who are not going to under, you know, not going to see a place where they can explore their faith and ask their questions. And I think that's one of the things the pandemic has enabled for us is for people to join in, like to, to kind of, to, to from you know in a, in a in a background kind of way I can watch the service and if it's kind of not of if I'm not really connecting with this I can always you know disappear or <laughs> note that I have a bad internet connection or something but I found that people in my parish were sharing links to our service to friends that they might not have felt comfortable inviting to church on a Sunday morning to walk through the door but you know, you could share an email and say, here's a link from our service, might be something here that you find helpful. Um, so I think, again, just knowing that these things are, there are ways to reach out to other people and that, that church gathering community takes all kinds of forms. And we had a small group discussion on medical assistance and dying, and it was a small group just sharing their thoughts and, and um, concerns and questions and beliefs around that. And at the end of it, somebody said, you know, this is what church should be like. And I thought, well, this is how the church began. This is kind mm -hmm. of what it was like and can be like. So again, I think it's not the format. It's not the time frame. It is, you know, are we gathered? Are we um, exploring faith together? Are we kind of being fed and, and feeding each other and supporting each other? Um, are we feeling, you know, that, that Christ is in our midst in some way that we've experienced um, peace or or joy or or beauty or something else, you know, and, and again, yeah, it can be outside when we were, the pandemic began, and we didn't have Eucharist in the church, we had garden Eucharist, and it was beautiful, it was really lovely to be outdoors, and to be able to share, and that was midweek, and people felt safer being outside, we still didn't know a lot, I, I mean, and none of it, all of it, you know, has, has a place, and if people are connecting with it, I don't know who we are to say that this is not valid, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean they'll gravitate to Sunday morning like I eventually did. This may be um, this may be their community. This may be the way they encounter God um, and the way they're nurtured. So again, I think it's it is both and. You know, there's some we, we really should be looking at new ways. And then how do we keep those relationships going? How do we build and nurture those relationships so that there is that kind of connection with with clergy with lay people. Um, so that at times when you need that, um, you have a place uh, and, and people to go to. So mm. that's a lot more than you wanted me to say, but yeah, lots there. I, and I think I would wholeheartedly agree with you, uh, Bishop Sandra, but I, I just want to, I want to be a bit of a party pooper, really. Yes. Uh, <laughs> because the, the latest stats can information suggest to us that a very great number of people are not even looking. They don't necessarily even know that they're looking or whatever, whatever. And that demographic tends to be, according to stats, can the younger demographic. But the, that, and I think we have to we have to take note of that. And also, and and I'm only being a party pooper in the sense of pointing it out, because I also think that God is doing something that we don't even know about. If God is who we say God is, then God is actually not prepared to be just pushed to the sidelines by people who look at whatever they think church is and dismiss it, or whatever they think faith is and dismiss it. So I think an important thing for us is to begin to sort of think, okay, to push those questions a little further to understanding our communities. Not, I mean, uh, so I spent most of my life trying to train people in mission and evangelism. I used to get paid to do that. And, you know, the assumption back 20, 30 years ago was people had enough information to make reasoned decisions about who God is, who Jesus is, and whether they wanted to get involved in that. More and more, that is less and less the case. And so, but but God is out there. And, and I'm just going to give you one example uh, uh, of this. Uh, recently, I'm, I went to Ghana in order to uh, take a, a, 
a vehicle that we'd uh, been able to supply to our companion diocese. When I went into the bank, a bank I don't normally go into, uh, to get my money to go, the guy behind the counter asked me why I was, what, what, where, why I wanted the money, basically. And so I explained to him about the project. Now he looked at me and said, and he was a guy in his early 20s, I would say, and he just looked at me and he said, look, he said, I've got no time for church, but that's great. If church was like that, I might actually think about it. <laughs> and you know that, where is the spirit working? Hmm. And how, and, and that leads us to all kinds of questions. And I know it leads us to all kinds of questions around, well, how do you fund that? Well, there are going to be times when you do fund that, but also times when if we as individual Christians are working out our ministry as we go through our daily work, our daily time at our seniors' residence, whatever it is, if we're doing that, working out that ministry, yes, there may be a need to fund it, but there's less of a need to fund it, if you know what I mean. And we so discipleship, I believe, is crucial to where we're going, to, to actually enable us to be more literate about our faith. Picking up yeah. on and, and I think Bishop Sue has got a very made just made a very good point, by the way. Thank and you if you didn't it. see it, <laughs> who's praying about this? Because that's really where we start. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That deep listening to mm -hmm. God and, and to our neighborhood, to our neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and watching our assumptions, probably. Um, I'm wondering, as we're thinking about connecting, and you mentioned the, the stats can, Bishop David, um, there's a growing number of what we call nuns, fo folks who have no connection to any faith community, let alone a Christian faith community, um, that growing number and, and younger people. Um, so if we are to um, encourage and equip, invest in uh, ministers um, to do that kind of work, probably church planters, missioners, and in, in all kinds of shapes and varieties, what kinds of of, of, um, of gifts or charisms might we look for? I mean, one of the things that as we're, as we're thinking about where God might be calling us is to say, hey, I think you have a calling or I think you have a gift there. Um, what kinds of things do we need that, that might be different than say a traditional kind of ministry role as a, as a rector or licensed lay minister, something like that? Well, I think one of those gifts, and it doesn't mean that that traditional um, people who are called to traditional forms of ministry don't have it, but I know that parishes often are looking for somebody who who can go out, um, who who don't expect to sort of minister to those who come, but who can intentionally go out. And not everyone is comfortable, um, you know, having time in the coffee shop trying to engage people in in questions of life and meaning and faith. Uh, but I think the comfort of that, the, the comfort of um, being able to, to kind of find common ground with people, like to, to make connections with people, I think, um, I think a real love for people, you have to like people, you have to really, and you have to be interested in other people's journey. And I think, um, not with a view of how we're going to save people. Um, I think that it's just a, there's a whole trying to discover how God is at work in that person's life. That might not be a question you ask them, but but you're kind of looking at that and listening. And I think it is a posture of humility. I think uh, that was mentioned before that the church really needs to adopt a, a posture of humility. We are not um, we are not in the Christendom days where people came to church because it's what you did. Um, they're on the golf course, they're skiing, they're doing all kinds of other things. And you know, in nature, they're experiencing something um, of glory and majesty that connects them to creation, um, to a creator, perhaps. So you can't you can't dismiss that. So how do we assume that we don't have all the answers, but you know that we can actually learn something from from people in their lives as well? They have something to teach us. So I think the humility is a really big thing. And again, not that people don't have it, but I think 
really recognizing that as the church, as, as Archbishop David said, you know, there isn't always trust. Um, there is a lot of skepticism. There's a lot of sense that the church is irrelevant, that we don't talk about things that matter. matter. I think when we preach about relevant issues um, that have been in the news or that are facing our communities, people we know, the world, um, people kind of sit up and go, oh, like, that's relevant. Like, I just read about that last week or heard that on the news this morning. So I think that help it finding ways to, to help us be more engaged in those kinds of ways. Um, but I, but I think that the, the ability to talk to strangers, the ability to, to kind of build relationships, hospitality, genuine Christian hospitality, um, that is inviting of other people. I mean, Jesus did that. He, he built uh, relationships with people who were very different, who were outcast, who didn't meet to the norms of society and, and religious society, at least, um, and he was comfortable meeting people where they were, um, and calling them to follow. Uh, so I think how we do that kind of deep relational work, the listening, the respect for people and people's journeys, um, knowing that God is active, I, I think, um, yeah, again, that doesn't mean they're not, th those gifts aren't present elsewhere, it, but I think intentionally, this is what we need. Yeah, I mean, I think we need, we need pastors, undoubtedly, because whatever we do in reaching folks and they're being drawn into relationship with us and further into relationship with God. My experience is that people who, who, who are good at that aren't necessarily good at leading people onto the next stage because that their gift is to be out there and, you know, do whatever. So we need pastors, but we also need um, those who have, uh, as you say, Bishop Sandra, for want of a better phrase, entrepreneurial skills. In other words, to be able to think differently. And I think that's um, something that we, and also people who are willing to fail. Right. But additionally to that, also bishops and other church leaders who are willing to let other people fail and not say oh well that didn't work we can't try anything like that again or whatever whatever because and oh well you failed there so therefore you're <laughs> you're out of ministry kind of thing because actually anyone who starts a small business or anywhere uh is um uh, I mean, we, um, I know a, an entrepreneur uh, who leads entrepreneurs in our, in our province. She won't let anyone onto her entrepreneur course unless they've had at least one failed business because they don't know enough. So, you know, it's, we have to be willing to see and say, okay, that, that didn't work, but we did that in faith and we believed that that was right. I mean, if we look at it, the life of Jesus, it's a failure. <laughs> really, he ends up on a cross. <laughs> but yet, we know what happened next. So, you know, things can apparently disappear into the ground and then appear um, very differently. So we just, I think we just have to be willing to be more open and to encourage people, whether they're in full-time ministry, as we might call it, or just living as Christians, to be willing to risk. Or, as we might put it in Christianese, have faith. Hmm. I think, too, some of this work is our work collectively as as clergy and um lay members of parish people in the world as you said um and i and i think i mean one of the things that i i've often been sometimes well do i wear my collar do i not wear my collar when i go here because you kind of know that can have very different um impacts do you when people say when they're cutting your hair so what do you do for a living like do you tell them or not you don't know where that's going to go but you know I, I mean, I remember being in a coffee shop and having my collar on and this woman, uh, there were two of us, two clergy, both with collars, and this woman was there with a stroller and looking around and, and then looked at us both and said, 
I have to go to the washroom. Like, could you look after my child while I go to the washroom? So like how, and we're not all visible and that we all don't wear collar, but but not being afraid to be who we're called to be, whether that's clergy or, or laity, but people of faith and not being afraid to share that in a way, hopefully that builds trust that doesn't, we're not trying to hit people over the head. Um, but but I've seen that. And, and when I think about how we engage with young people, it kind of going back a bit to what Archbishop David was talking about. I mean, I have a, an 18 year old and a 20 year old, and I'm always interested in that age group who cares very much about uh, racial justice, about environmental issues. And I know my my daughter particularly has been on, um, you know, the, um, the the Fridays for Future walks. And I remember asking her once, like, oh, I didn't know you were going on that walk. Like, I would have liked, I, I would have gone on that walk with you. And she said, really? Um, the, the disconnect sometimes between the causes that people believe in and think are really important and valuable and not seeing that this is the work of the church as well. And this is what we're called as people of faith to be concerned about, to be concerned about people being treated equally uh, with respect, with dignity, like our baptismal vows um, say, and safeguarding creation, all those kinds of things. Some of it's, you know, knowing where people are, um, what are the causes that matter to them? Can we come alongside and learn from them, but journey with them and build relationships with them so that they see a different way of understanding faith and Christianity and the church that, you know, we care about these things too. Um, and we want to, you know, we, we want to witness to that with you. Um, I think that those are kind of important things. So again, being, being, I guess, unashamedly who you are, whatever role that that is for you um, in, in your daily life, um, where that's appropriate, sharing that. And I think just to, to, to build on that a little bit, Bishop Sandra, I think the, uh, the book that changed my life, how about that? That's, and it isn't the Bible, although that did too. Uh, but uh, the book that changed my life is a little book called uh, The Isaiah Vision by Raymond Fong. Mm. And he was the uh, he was the World Council of Churches Evangelism Guide thirty years ago, mm. and he basically he said, "So how do we do effective evangelism mission?" He said, "What we do is we find people in our communities that we can actually work with and work with them, whatever it is they're doing for the good of the community, and just go and be there, whether it's the soup kitchen or the soccer club or whatever it is." Just go and be there. Be there as a Christian. At some point, you may get the opportunity to invite those people to say thank you to God. Maybe in a formal way, maybe in an informal way. If that opportunity arises, then do it. And you may also get um, an opportunity at coming out of that to have a thought of conversations about matters of faith and, and following Christ. But he said, you can't begin at the end. You begin at the beginning by, well, it actually, to come to Bishop Sue's point, you begin at the beginning by praying a lot. Mm. And then you, be, you go out and just be with people. And certainly uh, in my last diocese in England, any number of our parishes took that approach and found that they had significant community impact. Uh, I won't tell you a whole bunch of stories, but I can just tell you that. Yeah, and I think that's deep incarnational ministry. When one of the books that I found really in influenced my life um, was by Andrew Root, and I think it's called Incarnational Ministry, but talks about his experience in youth ministry and um, how he thought he had so much to offer and how, how he kind of came in initially in that ministry with that with an agenda and people were his projects and it was his job to convert them and and when he could kind of um when that humility kind of kicked in and he realized that this approach wasn't really working and he could simply come alongside people and get to know them for who they were and respect them for who they were interestingly deeper relationship formed trust formed and and he was in a place where when if it was appropriate it, it wasn't always but if it was appropriate there were opportunities then to to talk about well this faith that he had and what it meant to him and how it helped him and it was a natural organic conversation it wasn't something that was you went into with an agenda so i think um the potential for that is is real in in all the places we find ourselves in daily life and if we if we look at the Jesus example, 
That's the ultimate example of incarnational ministry. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the, if, if Jesus is saying, come follow me, then he's, he's asking us to go in that direction, I would mm -hmm. suggest. It's us working it out how that works in our situation that's the issue, rather than, uh, rather than taking the come to us approach. Yeah, and I would say, too, if we have what Lisa would call and what literature calls a lively faith, I mean, it does spill out. I remember being in a job in St. John's, Newfoundland. I was not ordained, but I was going to this church that was the one that formed me in this team ministry model. Um, and I was really excited about what was happening in church. And so in the lunch, like in the cafeteria, when I was having lunch in this hospital with all kinds of people, I wasn't trying to, you know, like, what did you do Sunday night? Well, I went to church. Oh, and then you have this conversation. And people were just sort of surprised, fascinated that I found that I was so excited and interested in what I was doing and learning. And I think, again, if we find can find places that enliven us, um, that that kind of spills over into how we talk about that, because it's a part of who we are. Like if we have a passion for jazz music, I, it probably comes up in conversation when you eventually um, start talking to people and building relationships. So it's not, you don't try to, you know, make them um you know a jazz um follower or or someone who loves jazz as well but you know this is a passion of yours so again i think when we can enliven people in their faith that that's going to have an effect too um mm -hmm. because you're being we're being fed and nurtured and this is going to be something that that we want to talk about in some way that we want to share with people because they think gee you, you you're in a pretty good mood today <laughs> you know i went to church and it was great and we had this conversation about this and music was lovely and you know it, it does have an effect and i think also again looking in the chat bishop, bishop sue makes a good point this is all about time mm. we, we we're looking for quick fix, fix band-aid solution and actually, we have to take time to build relationship again. We had, we had, basically, relationship came to us 30, 40 years ago. But now that isn't the case. And how do we build those? How do we, I mean, one of the churches that I was referring to around the Isaiah vision, a church that I've kind of kept in contact yeah. with, um, they, it's a 35 year journey for them. And now you can hardly tell where the church stops and the village begins. Hmm. But it's 35 years and four different incumbents. Because why? Because actually the ministry has been lele. The incumbents have come in and allowed the laity to continue to do <laughs> what they were doing before. I'm aware we have about 30 minutes left, and I'm wondering if folks who are joining us today have any questions for Archbishop David or Bishop Sandra, and if you include those in the chat box, that'd be great. Um, as well, I wanted to touch base with both of you about what are you seeing on the ground as some kind of team ministry that might be a bit interesting, unusual. Um, again, we're not cloning from parish to parish or diocese to diocese, but what are you seeing that's working as ministry teams? I know we've had a number of folks discerning a call as deacons, vocational deacons here. And just what, what seems to be emerging for us is as, as folks are saying, I'm, I'm going to step into some kind of ministry or leadership role. I think some of that is... Um... I'm trying to think of how to definitely um, ministries again when I was formed while there was there were certainly active lay ministries and lay leaders it, it still was very much a clerical model uh, I think we did have a paid um, non-ordained youth minister at the time um, or eventually but 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 seeing more and more ministry teams that are that are shared um, we tried an idea and failed. There's a mouse going across my floor. Sorry. <laughs> he likes to join me when I have evening meetings uh, in my office. Um, a church mouse. Um, yeah, they're, they're um, yeah, it's seeing that that kind of leadership that is a shared model. Uh, we tried the idea of having somebody who was 
non-ordained serve in kind of a role like a priest in charge without sacramental ministry like if, if that lay person could be the hub um and we called it at that time a pastoral associate it didn't really work in that parish which which had highly sacramental clerical model and then people got into the well if we're paying someone to do that we can do that except they hadn't really you know there hasn't really always been an expression that that was um something that was wanted um that the people felt they could or had the energy to do that so i think building could we build models um that maybe have some laity as the core instead of the clergy. And for some clergy, that might sound very threatening. I realize that. But in some places, um, we have really gifted lay peoples who do not feel called, um, do not discern a call to being ordained. Um, and there are clergy around who do not feel called to serve in part-time or full-time ministries, but are willing to help. So is there a different way to kind of, it, it, you know, I'm seeing possibilities at least, because I think we learned a lot of things about that. And how do we, uh, how do we look at that as a potential model where we could maybe have, um, you know, a pastoral administrator, a pastoral associate who's not an ordained person, but has gifts for a particular kind of ministry, pastoral or otherwise, who could be a kind of hub um, to connect clergy and other laity and and kind of connect the pieces. So that that's one thing that I still kind of still sits in the back of my mind thinking there's something to this. And that, and that came out of a, a discussion at diocesan council too, where one of the lay members of diocesan council said, you know, if we're looking at different models of ministry, are we looking at models that employ lay people or are we only talking about models that employ clergy and expect lay people, laity to be unpaid volunteers? And I, and I, it was kind of that moment where you think, yeah, that is kind of often the way we see it. So what would it look like if we flip that in some in the places where that makes sense? It's not, again, a cookie cutter, but I, but I think there's real possibility for something like that um, to work. And maybe there's, you know, clusters of parishes that could work under that model where you have a, the paid person, um, the full time or part time person who who gets uh, a particular stipend is is not ordained. And, and the ordained folks support the ministry. So again, I, I just, that's one thing that I'm not sure I could say it's working, but I think there's something to that that, that could be effective. Yeah, and I think, I mean, we're reaching <laughs> for different models. And to be honest, we're, we've got a lot more reaching to do. And I just saw a, a comment there from David Bell, who's, the, for those who don't know, is the uh, Boston Chancellor in uh, in uh, uh, Fredericton Diocese and worships in one of our more rural parishes and I think you know there, is, there, there has to be a place for lay led and lay paid ministry but um, I think there's also a place and, and I, I'm not sure how we get there from here but um, the um, for, for a number of you that uh, let me just wind the thing back to its way Back in uh, 1990, uh, when I was working on the staff of the Synod of the Diocese of Chelmsford in the UK, um, a report was uh, published by the Church of England called uh, Faith in the Countryside. And it was looking at rural ministry. Um, and one of the important recommendations that came out of that, and I don't think the Church of England's really ever acted upon it, was that every community needed needs a parson and what they meant by that was every community need take the A out and put an E in, needs a person who was identified as the church person. And that they don't need to be a cleric, but they need to be a person in that community who people can relate to. And they'll probably need some training. It's interesting that about uh, four or five weeks ago, I was reading an article in the Church Times which was advocating exactly that. Uh, it's only taken like 30 odd years for it to get come around again. But it's just interesting that I think there is something around that, uh, that we need to, and I, people in the diocese have heard me thinking out loud about this a couple of times, but I'm still trying to work out how that is worked out, uh, along with all the other stuff that we have to work out. But I think there's something important there about personification, image bearing, all of those kind of words that we would put theologically. 
So I'm just noticing a couple of the questions um, and just wondering, so two of them that I could, I'll just mention with Stephen uh, Scribner, the total ministry, I'm very aware of that. And I was, I attended one of the Living Stones uh, gatherings and, and I read the total ministry stuff. And at the time, many years ago, I remember thinking, oh, that's just so segmented and so compartmentalized. And how do you how you build ministry that just seems so enclosed in that way. So I, I was really, I really struggled with it. Um, but I guess where, where I have landed on some of that stuff now is seeing if it's part of a cohesive whole and, and some of the lines aren't necessarily um, solid lines, but dotted lines where, where ministries um, kind of seep into each other, perhaps in some ways, and where there is intentional forming and equipping of teams, not just not just um, equipping of individuals for a team, but equipping a team to be a team. I think in many dioceses, it would be safe to say, maybe not all, but, but in some, um, we form teams and not always um, with... Um, with the kind of equipping of how they're going to work together as a team, maybe with some intentional choosing around different gifts that would be complementary. Uh, but I think in, in a lot of times, a lot of things I've seen, there's been a hope that it would work. And, and maybe we haven't had um, the awareness of what it takes to make a team function. So systems theory and those kinds of interpersonal dynamics that, that can help a team to thrive or not. So I think whatever we do in the future, there really needs to be some intentional equipping of a team, not just equipping of individuals for ministry. So, um, so I see that in a different way that there can be a ministry that, that has pieces to it, but the pieces need to fit together somehow. People, there needs to be really good communication, really good role definition and clarity around who does what, what you share, what people have as individual ministries that they take the lead on. Um, and I think if you can do some of those things, they can be really successful and really, really fruitful. Mm -hmm. And I think with Tanya's, uh, Tanya Moxley's question, we're looking at that. We're looking for places where that could happen. I don't know that it is emerging in some ways, although it's emerging as parishes working together, again, not always out of a sense of desperation, but a sense of there's some really, we could do some interesting things if we work together. A parish, I, someone I talked to the other day, the parish could continue in full-time ministry for a number of years, but they don't think that's the way forward. They, they're thinking, you know, we could do this, but I don't know, there's real potential if we thought about a different way of working with neighboring parishes and building a team. So there's curiosity. And I think it's just how do we get to the next step from curiosity to trying and knowing that we're not going to get it all right and being comfortable with the failure with, I mean, whatever you want to call it, but, but, you know, it, knowing that it's going to take a while and that what we do in any one place, we can take some principles from that, but some things will be different for another another context and another group of people, another team. So I think there's, I'm, I'm excited about the possibility of that. And I think it does, it does require a group of parishes to come together and being willing to, to test this, to try this and see if it could work and knowing it may, it may not, but could we do that? The hard part about doing that is when we're calling particularly people who are paid to, to carry out some of these ministries uh, if they're clergy, they're often moving around. So I think that becomes a challenge if if someone's moving and moving a family, perhaps a, a, sp a spouse or partner. Um, what does it look like if this you try something for two or three years and you're not sure where it's going to go? So so there are some challenges, but I think there's lots of possibility there. And I think I would echo that, Bishop Sandra. I think that's where we are. We can we have a number of parishes that are asking to do shared ministry, and we're trying to work out what that means. But um, I'm not, it, it's going to take time. We, we, we've been wedded to this, to, the, to our current model for a long time. Right. And the, moving those goalposts is, 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 is difficult. Certainly, you know, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not seeing that in my episcopacy, however long that's going to continue, uh, that we're going to have met, have transitioned from one thing to another um but i think we you know we've got to make moves in those directions and i think also um um there and we've got to we i think i really believe we have to look at this is how we um might learn from the the celtic minster model mm. where there was a central point and people went out from there into their communities but how that works, how that worked 
in the dark ages, as it were, and how that works now is a big question. There's a lot of sort of literature written around the way the Celtic uh, Christians did these things, but how we we did, how we translate that. But I think that that's important because the Celtic model didn't merely look at the spiritual side of life. It looked at the economic impact, etc., of churches and and how they really um, in, were incarnational in their communities. And I think there are a few examples of that around the world but it's the, you know I think we've got to try and take that model seriously and as you can tell by the way I'm struggling for words I don't even know what that what, I don't even know that I know what I'm that I understand what I'm saying I could pick up on the Celtic piece a little bit um because one of the questions I noticed was from Gillian Power about language and and I became really aware of that and thinking of Celtic Celtic Christianity and some of the stuff that comes out of the Iona community and the Northumbria community and um, and the la the la language sorry is um, it's very grounded in, it's very earthy and grounded in the daily lives of people um, and a sense of the sacredness of everyday life and the sacredness of every act you know there were prayers when you made the bed and prayers when you got up in the morning and prayers when you went to bed and prayers when you went out to the fields and you know the, the, there was a life soaked in awareness of the presence of the divine and so there were prayers for all kinds of things and and the language really um i mean it, it appeals to me i i know it doesn't appeal to everyone but but there is something about yeah what would it look like to you know could we are there ways to create new liturgies or adapt liturgies it doesn't it, it could that could be some of sunday morning stuff it doesn't have to be um i always used um holy week and other um seasonal times um all souls day as opportunities to really experiment with language liturgy poetry uh, incorporating other forms of music um that might really connect with people who don't normally walk into a church building to engage in something called worship, um, but might come because they know the singer or this looks a little bit different. Um, and, you know, I'm curious. Uh, so I think there is, um, I think we have to be willing to, to, to do those kinds of things. And um, during the pandemic, I, I found I was very aware of that too, that and I struggled and I, and I don't know, I mean, who knows what you, Kind of get right. I don't know if get right. So it's not really the right expression, but but being willing to think, okay, what is it that people need when they're in our case at that point, we they were listening to worship because it was an audio. Um, so what do they need to hear? Like what is it that's gonna gonna help them realize God is with them in this time and and they're being held and they're being encouraged and supported. Um, so like it, it's being willing to know that sometimes that's very traditional language like the Lord's Prayer and other kinds of psalms and and readings and music or whatever so some of that is what's going to ground people but sometimes it's naming the reality in a way that sometimes our liturgical language doesn't do in a way that's accessible for people who are unchurched or you know haven't really tried to unpack the language so I mean I've always been in favor of of trying to work with that um, within reason I think we can kind of go way too much the other way but I think to be really grounded um, in that and, and I think to create to try to I don't know if you can create holy space but to to enable a sense of holiness to to kind of emerge from what you are doing in your gathering if it's worship um, so I think how do we how do we yeah, create that, encourage it, nurture it. I don't, I don't know. Make space for it. Um, I think those are all important things. And again, when uh, we're thinking about young people and those who aren't engaged now, the language is they don't know what we're we don't they don't know what we're talking about. It doesn't, and it doesn't necessarily draw them in. They just are confused. So sorry, David, go ahead. Yeah, and I think just to 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 push on that a little bit, I think the uh a, a sermon series that I did quite a while ago when I was in a parish um, was called the Heineken series. I won't bore you with the reason why it was called that. But the um, the purpose behind it was to examine those books of the Bible that we very rarely look at. Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Lamentations, those places. And it was very interesting to note that people who were kind of 
on the edge of faith, found those much more helpful than the normal stuff I talked about. And they elicited much more discussion because in a sense, those places, those, those books of scripture are dealing with very real earthy situations where people are just struggling with the whole of exi existence in a way. And we have to, I think, part of the thing is we have to give people the space to struggle. Um, both with members of our congregations and the opportunity for people who we might encounter outside to sit and rather than to say, OK, I'm going to solve all your problems here to say, OK, let's sit together in this struggle and let's see what the Christian, what the what the Christian faith or the Bible or whatever it is has to say about this to recognize that, in fact, what you're experiencing is something that people have experienced for generations and it has caused them to question God. It's caused them to do all kinds of things, but yet somehow God has come through in that situation and they've somehow been able to reach, reach beyond themselves. So, I, it, again, a scattered thought, but I think that's important. Mm. And it's been really encouraging to hear you both kind of bounce back and forth with ideas and, um, and admitting fully we don't know what the roadmap ahead looks like um and i think for a lot of us it's it's been encouraging to think that we knew what was ahead even though <clears throat> probably we never really did <laughs> um and you know and it's and it's encouraging to hear you know both of you encouraging your people um to say take a risk and we'll have your back um you know and it, it's a message that people um, I think after almost nine years, they're starting to believe um, in our diocese. And, you know, I know um, my experience of, of um, both you, Bishop Sandra and Lisa, is that, you know, you have a similar mindset of like, you, you know, we'll stand with you and support you. When, you know, when we think about all of this, um, you know, changes in terms of how we bring the gospel, how we communicate the gospel, how we reach the unchurched, um, while, you know, both maintaining what we've been used to and also exploring new opportunities and new, new mediums, I'm assuming we have to wrestle with the fact that how we form people and equip people is going to change too. Uh, because, you know, the model has also been, you know, hey, Bishop, I feel called into ministry. I, you know, I want to give my life to this. Um, I go away for three years. I get trained. I know everything. Um, and even in talking with, you know, our, our, our seminaries, uh, um, they're seeing numbers dra dramatically going down as well um, in terms of people offering for vocational ministry. Um, what do you guys think, you know, while appreciating we're all wrestling <laughs> this out, what could our formation and our equipping look like as we're um, navigating these waters? I think our formation has to begin in prayer. I think we actually have to learn how to pray. And I'm probably one of the last people to, to, to say that because people who know me know that often that doesn't work very well. But I think the, the, w any ministry of the church has to come out of prayer. How do we, informing people, move them away from pragmatic solutions to prayerful discernment. Mm. I think we've had a lot of years in the church where we've taken a managerial approach and a pragmatic approach. And I mean, if we read, you know, the Book of Common Prayer, what is the purpose of the priest? I, and I'd want to broaden that to everybody. But what it, the purpose of the, why is the, per, the priest set aside for ministry? to study and pray and serve the community that they're called to. But the study and the prayer is important. That doesn't mean you don't do the other stuff, but our ministry comes out of our prayer. 
and out of our study. And uh, I think we, if we, <laughs> that that tends to be lost in formation um, at at our colleges and 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 everywhere. Uh, you know, yeah, it's it's a it's a pro. You know, I remember when I was a student and David Eisen, who was uh, our college chaplain at the time. You know, I went to David. I said, you know, David, it's a waste of time us doing morning and evening prayer every day. It, we're just doing it by rote. And David turned to me and said, merely by being here and saying the words, you are expressing your intention to be prayerful in your ministry. And you need to go through the pain of this <laughs> in order to discover what it is to be a prayerful minister. Now, I don't know that I ever went through the pain of it, uh, but nonetheless, that was very forming uh, comment for me. I would say our formation too. <laughs> this is going to be counterintuitive, but I, I would hope it could move people into uncertainty rather than mm -hmm. certainty, because there are a lot of people who come already knowing, um, really feeling very strongly that they know where and how God is calling them. I, I guess I've just never been that kind of person, so maybe I find it hard to relate. <laughs> um, you know, I know people who knew from the time they were 12 that, that God was calling them to be a priest. I had no idea until I did, and it was a bit of a surprise to me. Uh, but how how do we allow, help people, I think, to wrestle? Because Because I think we don't know yet what God is doing in our, I mean, we, we have some sense of where things are changing. I think the fact that it's becoming more collaborative seems like there's a lot of reading and uh, research around some of that. Like I'm hearing that, seeing it's popping up all the time. I, I think we can see the signs of some of this stuff of the future. Uh, so how do we help people to live with uncertainty around what it's going to look like? Because I think um, we're still forming people in a lot of ways for a ministry that doesn't exist anymore. Um, not in the way that that I even knew it at the beginning of my ministry, it's changed that much. So how do we help people become uh, comfortable with uncertainty? Um, how do we help people um, be adaptable? How do we, it's kind of like knowing grammar, like when you understand grammar well, you know when you can kind of play with it and when you can use a sentence in a certain way, begin with and, even though, you know, you're told not to do that, but if you really understand it. So if we can kind of help people understand some core things and, and principles and such so that they can adapt and, and be a little more flexible um, and be attentive to how ministry is changed because it'll, it'll just keep changing. We're not going to ever get it nailed down as soon as we just like stages when your kids are growing up, just when you get used to a stage and you know how to deal with this stage, they move into a new one. And I think ministry is a lot like that. Um, just as you get comfortable with how to do this, something comes at you and there's a whole new reality that you have to face. So how do we equip people for, um, for some of that? I think that's, um, I think that's that's really important that we that we help to kind of create um, encourage sort of a, an adaptability and a willingness uh, to to keep learning. I, I think we have to be continuous learners. I think we have to be lifelong learners. We have to. I, I think I still. You know, we have to read. Uh, we have to pray. We have to read the new stuff that's out there about what's happening in the church. We have to pay attention to what's going on. I think we have to engage with community organizations too. There's a lot of good work happening in our community organizations. And during my um, training for ministry when I was at seminary, one of my placements was in a women's shelter. That was a request I had. I wanted to, I'd had done some work with women's communities and women's groups before. And what I learned about people's understanding of the church and the lack of trust and the real things people struggle with, uh, that was something I couldn't have learned in a course um, or in a parish placement, likely, maybe, but but not likely. So even, you know, could the learning be not all parish-based, but could we, could we, and I know that's happened in our diocese at least, but but it's not a standard piece of the, the training for ministry that we spend time with a community-based organization with like an NGO or somebody who's doing work around poverty allevi alleviation or um, racial justice or something like that. But, you know, we learn a lot from those organizations uh, in terms of, um, of and how the church can engage and how faith engages with some of the, the challenges they face. So I think those, those would be a few things. Um, but again, like helping people to to be open to God, maybe calling you somewhere you don't think God is calling you, 
and not to be not to be too tied to to the outcome i mean i think of abraham and you know god is calling him to somewhere i will somewhere i will show you Mm -hmm. Uh, it's you know you journey by stages you don't know all you know is okay i guess this is the next place to stop and lay our heads down and get a have a break and get a bite to eat and then the next stage and it's kind of revealed over time and so you know if you knew that's where god was going to lead you would you have gone maybe not (laughs) but you kind of so the the journeying by stages really is helpful to be open to the twists and turns and the changes along the way in you and in the community and in the church because we don't always know we know we need people who are entrepreneurial who are curious who are adaptable um creative i think and um and again that that love for people that love the love of god the love of christ um and and what christ stood for and embodied uh, i think all those things are important so mm-hmm. I, I bet, and again we tend to have that very prescribed as you said three year program so um we have more and more people who are doing the five year program or the six year because life doesn't enable them to stop everything and go to school for three years mm-hmm. so even that is challenging our systems because we have it all plotted out that you do this term and then you do a placement and you do this term and then you do that piece and and people are not they're not following the path and that's happening more and more in our diocese. So how do we adapt our systems and our structures to how it is they need to learn mm. and how they're growing into a, a sense of vocation? I'm, I'm just, I, there's nothing I don't agree with with Bishop Sandra and all those people who are saying Bishop Sandra's bang on, that's he is. But I just want to throw something back at that. I've, I've noticed a conversation in the chat around um, Wi-Fi poverty, effectively. So. Um, here's a challenge. There's nothing wrong with lobby, lobbying government, but uh, many of our buildings have long, tall, pointy, spiky things on the top of them that are quite high up. They're called spires. W- what's the possibility of ecumenically churches developing their own Wi-Fi systems in order to enable uh, to break Wi-Fi poverty? I'm just throwing that out there as an idea because I think... That's part of the role that we can have. Now, it could come to nothing. It could come to something. But I think, you know, there there are possibilities to churches to actually serve their communities in that kind of way if you can get the right conversations going. And, uh, you know, I know of a couple of places where the uh, um, in different parts of the world where the church is actually the Wi-Fi provider Mm -hmm. for the district. So, you know, yeah, we can lobby government, but also we can perhaps help with being part of the answer to the solution mm. and to the problem. And, and there are grants available for some of that work. Uh, I mean, I think if the church could think, if you could provide a hub for people to, and a, and a bank of computers that people could use or laptops that um, like the libraries do in some of the communities I've lived in, but if the church could be that kind of place. Um, I mean, I learned recently that there's there's somebody who does that kind of work, the kind of work of going into congregations and to to, to church uh, facilities and looking at what's there and what the knowing kind of has already done community needs assessment work and can sort of say well you know there are x number of organizations within so many kilometers of you that are looking for a space that has this this and this you have this and this you could have this too and then um, you could be really providing something that this community needs Um, and then again you also have that opportunity to to build relationships with other community-based groups, provide space for services that are not otherwise available in the community. Um, So I I think all of that is important. Hmm. It's been really encouraging. I mean, and it's been encouraging hearing from both of you and again, empowering um, our diocese to be, you know, thinking outside the box, thinking creatively. And Part of me, as as Lisa and I began talking last fall about this potential series, it's been, um, without realizing it, the two of you have really set a nice tone for what the next six months um, potentially are going to look like, because a lot of these are topics we want to be hitting um, throughout this um, um, Reconnect and Reframe series, recognizing that a lot of us are... Um, you know, we, we might live in different communities, but our dioceses are, are wrestling with the same realities um, and same demographics. And so, um, uh, Bishop Sandra, Archbishop David, thank you both so much for um, 
not only tonight um, and for the vulnerability that you both shared, but for your leadership um, during our diocese or in our diocese during our this time. Because, um, um, you know, there are many days when we don't know what tomorrow is going to look like, especially with all of the challenges and, and um, things that come up in diocesan leadership. And um, as we said at the beginning, I do think it's exciting times that we're in. Um, and even though I, you know, love to wake up tomorrow with an email to say, here's the next 10 steps to do. Um, and I'm sure someone listening tonight will send me that email with that direction and suggestion on what to do. Um, but, and Lisa, you might be one of them, um, to which I'd be happy to take your advice and counsel. Uh, I'm wondering, Lisa, for the benefit of, of those before they start um, uh, dozing off, um, could you kind of summarize um, the next, what the next couple of weeks could look like for us? So we are delighted to um, be um, taking advantage of Reverend Dr. Heather McCants, who's one of the professors at Montreal Dial. And so I wanted to remind folks uh, that for the next three sessions, as we look at collaborative ministry leadership, and she's going to be looking at all kinds of models, bivocational, multivocational, what those kinds of teams work, what are, what are some ways that we avoid burnout, um, how do we communicate as, as teams, um, that kind of thing, some best practices. Uh, but I want to remind folks that we're starting at eight because she is teaching from Montreal, and which is a different time zone. So we'll be gathering at eight and going for a full two, uh, two hours till 10. Uh, and we will be sending you a new Zoom link this week. So it'll be probably next week. Um, so just wanted to let you know that. And as well, for those who aren't going to be able to make the three weeks, uh, let us know because we are paying tuition. Um, we think this is a really wise investment for both of our diocese, for lay and clergy, to be learning um, about where God is calling us and these collaborative ministry leadership teams. So we are really excited about Reverend Dr. Heather McCants though, because she is a fabulous teacher and really dynamic. And I think she has so much to offer us. So next week we begin at eight o'clock and we'll send you the Zoom link. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting to have this opportunity again, to wrestle these questions out, to, to share, to, to recognize uh, we're all in this, um, and trying and trying to discern this uh, together, um, and I think it's important for us to commit to praying um, together for one another. Um, let's uh, again thank you to uh, Bishop Sandra and to Archbishop David, uh, and to all of you who joined us uh, tonight uh, for this conversation. Uh, let's uh, close uh, with a prayer. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we uh, have been before you tonight, uh, we give you thanks uh, that you have called us, that you invite us to be part of the ongoing uh, mission of your church. And thank you that ultimately you are the one who is in control and you are the one in charge. And uh, thank you for the privilege that uh, you extend to us to be part of that. Lord, as we uh, continue uh, at the beginning of this series, but more importantly, as we continue as leaders in the church, uh, we pray for incredible blessing and outpouring of your spirit upon uh, Bishop Sander, upon Archbishop David, upon all of our leaders throughout our diocese and communities. Uh, Lord, as we continue to walk in these uh, uncertain times and recognize that uh, the ground often sh seems to be shifting around us, uh, I pray that uh, we would have an incredible sense of your spirit uh, very near to us, uh, that uh, we would have that peace that is beyond our human understanding uh, that only comes from you. And uh, we pray that you would continue to be raising up leaders in our church, uh, and we pray that your spirit would be blessing our leadership uh, with creativity, with boldness, uh, with courage, uh, with hearts that are on fire for you. And we thank you for uh, the work of uh, those who have gone before us uh, in, in building up uh, your church and uh, strengthening um, the work of, of, of what all we all do uh, in our communities. And so, Lord, as, as we go from here, continue to inspire us, continue to challenge us, 
Uh, and Lord, we pray that um, those things that have been discussed tonight, um, that they might bear fruit and that you might continue to use each one of us uh, for your glory. And so we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's been a pleasure. And as Lisa mentioned, um, Lisa will be in touch with people from Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island and um, sorry, Fredericton, um, you'll hear from me. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to the next uh, few weeks as we continue wrestling with this and in, indeed for the next six months as uh, we'll continue to talk more about um, what the topics will be. Um, but it does flow very um, seamlessly with what we've been talking about tonight. So it's been uh, great to be with you. Um, drive safe on your way home. And uh, don't forget to grab a muffin uh, and a coffee for the trip. Uh, it's been good to be with you all. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Bye.